everyone and welcome to our wonderful webinar today. This is Dan Bewiner and I'm your host for today and Robert Lazarus will be joining us in just a moment. This webinar is going to be about how to improve course completion and certification rates. So let's talk a little bit about your host here and we are Simply Learn. Now, the wonderful thing about Simply Learn is that we're the most credible training provider for the digital age. So, founded in 2009, Simply Learn is one of the world's largest and leading providers of online training for digital marketing, cloud computing, project management, data science, IT, software development, and many other emerging technologies. We're based in Bangalore, India, and also San Francisco, California. We've helped over 500,000 professionals and companies across 150 countries get trained, acquire certifications, and upskill their employees. Our 400 training courses are designed and updated by world-class and world-leading industry experts. So the wonderful thing about our approach is that we have a blended learning approach that combines e-learning classes, instructor-led live virtual classrooms, applied learning projects, 24-7 teaching assistance. So we have more than 40 global training organizations that have recognized Simply Learn as an official provider of certification training. And we've also been named the eighth most influential education brand in the world by LinkedIn. And these are just some of the statistics about Simply Learn. And with this background, we have a lot of experience in helping people get certified, and trained and completing that training and now we're going to be able to share some of these statistics with you. So again, for how to improve course completion and certification rates, welcome. I'm Dan Bevener and Robert, how are you? Great. Welcome, welcome everybody. Good afternoon hope, or good morning to everyone. I hope everyone's having a great day. Um, to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, currently I'm the Director of Customer Success at Simply Learn in the U.S. Um, so I am based out of San Francisco, um, but my background is a lot of education. I have a lot to do with teaching and instruction and completion um, because I was a former uh, K through 12 principal. I also was a teacher. I was a dean of students, um, and I also currently am an adjunct instructor for a university where I teach master's courses um, in technology, teacher leadership, and curriculum and construction. So I um, have a I have a little bit of background knowledge on uh, what it's like to want to make sure that we are getting 100% uh, completion. Um, or at least uh, some great usage out of our courses when we're working with our learners. Great. Well, thank you, Robert. And I am Dan Bevener, and I'm the um, I'm the an instructor-led and e-learning curricular developer and presenter, and I'm the director of content marketing here at Simply Learn, as well as the director of training research. And I've come across a lot of information about not only what helps us improve our completion rates, but what helps other online courses from universities and business to business trainers. Uh, train their people well as well. So I have 15 years of experience in teaching and developing uh, curricula, including instructor-led training and video-based e-learning. And I'm certified in digital marketing and numerous other skills, including uh, aviation, I'm a pilot, and also other high-tech endeavors in the aviation field, including avionics. So that's just a little bit about me. But you are here to learn how you can improve your completion rates, because you invest so much money in your e-learning and development. And how do you ensure that your employees are actually finishing the training? Because just because you build it doesn't mean that they will come. Research shows that the typical completion rates for online courses can be as low as 4%. Now, whether your goal is to get your employees to learn new job skills or to get them certified, maximizing your return on investment depends on employees not just participating in training, but finishing it. So this is what we're going to be sharing with you today, sharing the current research on how to improve training completion rates, especially when it comes to online courses and other e-learning programs. The methods that we're going to describe here include techniques that have helped some training programs achieve completion rates, including Simply Learns, of as high as 72%. Well, let's talk a bit now about what we're going to talk about. First of all, we want to talk about course completion. Why does it matter? What does it matter to your business? We're also going to talk about the five top reasons why employees fail to complete the training. We're also going to show you how to spot pitfalls in your pitfalls in your training program before they become real issues that are hampering your completion rates. And then finally, and this is what you're all here for, I'm sure, is to discover the proven ways to improve completion of training and certifications. 
So moving ahead, let's uh, just give a little overview of your questions here. Now, uh, we have a moderator that's going to be monitoring our chat and also our questions. Those of you that have not been on a webinar before, uh, just familiarize yourself with the control panel here. You can maximize it or minimize it as you like by pressing that red arrow. And the little plus signs that you have down on the side of your menu there can uh, expand uh, a little box that will help you ask questions. Feel free to ask questions as you go on, and then those will be shared with us as we're talking. And uh, we'll take a break a little few few minutes in here and, and answer questions uh, that have come up, and then we'll do that again at the end. So again, you're all muted, so feel free to type in your questions, and we have a lot of people here to help you. So moving on, uh, the first person that is here to help you is uh, Robert Laziers. So tell us a little bit about why completion matters. So I think the one thing that people have to really consider is what are they trying to get out of any sort of training that they're going to do. And, and completion is a really important part of getting um, that goal of what you're looking to, to accomplish. But what we need to find out is, uh, you know, in terms of a company, is there something more than just completion that really is going to matter? So it, one thing we found that most companies invest in training in order to achieve real improvement in skill and practice. But we're also finding that organizations with a strong learning and development program are 56 percent more likely to be first to market and 17 percent more profitable than their peers and that's extremely important to note because having a goal and having a program in mind is really what's going to make it successful um, you know some situations make it hundred percent necessary for completion um, and in that case um, when training or certification is part of the corporate directive or a government mandate common and higher regulated industries like banking healthcare and insurance you're going to see that this is going to be a mandate it's going to be expected uh, for example, if you're looking at the, there's a new law for program management improvement and accountability act, and so that's telling us that if we are going to have anybody that's working in those um, courses, they have to have 100% completion. We need them so that they can be certified. Same with the Ethics Awareness Act as well as the IT Security Awareness Act. So if you are a company that's looking to certify your learners, this is a, sp a specific reason why we see a lot of people come across um, Simply Learn in terms of wanting to make sure that they have 100% completion for certification um, so that they can use that. Um, and and I, when I say use it, I think it's important to note that if you are actually going to be having that kind of certification, there are reasons for that certification. Um, excuse me, the Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics and NYSE Governance Services found that although 96% of organizations surveyed offer some kind of ethics and compliance training, 12% fail to achieve completion for mandatory co-training and 26 fail to complete risk training. And that's important, especially if you are um, going to be mandated by law. However, there are benefits, too. I'm sorry, go ahead, Dan. Oh, I was just going to say, that's, a, that's amazing that, that a, a full quarter of people in industries that actually require this training and certification don't even complete the training. Exactly. Which is, you know, in one sense, maybe a little bit scary in the, in the fact that um, it is a requirement and we don't have people finishing it. So I think having that program is what's going to be necessary. But to be honest with you, Dan, outside of just making sure that your, your learners are getting certified for the, let's say, the law for it, um, there are a ton of other benefits to making sure that your uh, learners are certified. For example, it's going to validate your employees' expertise to coworkers and customers. And I think that's important to be able to highlight. You have X number of uh, learners that are certified in, let's say, program management or ethics awareness. I think that's really important, and it also, you know, in reality, can increase potential company revenue um, by justifying to the client a higher billing rate because they have so many people that are certified. Um, it also, in, in that sense as well, eliminates re um, reliance on outside contractors because a lot of the work can be done internally if we have these people that have this certification, and I think that's really important to note as well. Right. That's a great point. Now, what's funny about that is that just because companies meet the completion and certification directors, now there's no guarantee that employees will actually remember and apply what they've learned to the job. And I know this is particularly true if the training is acquired hastily. So um, uh, there was a, a, a great quote that I saw, um, and uh, it was uh, uh, by uh, uh, Srivanas Krishnaway who said that 100% course completion is a great first step in meeting the business objectives. Uh, however, completion is by no means a reflection of the usefulness of the course. As there was a study of learners at companies with more than 5,000 employees, and it revealed that as few as 9% of trained employees actually applied what they've learned to their job to achieve positive results. 
Now, in some cases, course completion isn't critical to business objectives. For example, if the employees are able to demonstrate and apply those necessary skills even before the completion of the full course, then that may be enough. For example, the training gained in the first few units for un the, in the first few units of like a cybersecurity certification course, you know that may be enough to help people fix an organization's key vulnerability. Um, another real example is that in PMP training, 90% of people who complete the training do not actually go ahead and take the PMP certification exam. The main reason for that is because the, the cost of the exam is like $500 and in some cases even more expensive. So uh, just because it isn't complete, it doesn't mean they haven't learned something. But the more you can get people past that finish line, the better. Now, Bob, tell us a bit about why people fail to complete the training. What are the big hang-ups? So, Dan, it's funny because we talk about the fact that there are, you know, regulations and laws for certain types of training and 100% completion, but you also mentioned a few stats, and as I did, that there are areas where people just aren't getting it done. And so I will say that no matter how much we have a drive for it, there are going to be things that get in the way. Uh, let's say, for example, you see these 17, uh, excuse me, these seven um, reasons here, course too intensive, time constraints, lack of motivation. If you think about these, for example, course too intensive, there are a lot of times where we actually give a lot of educational materials and concepts and that are required, but it's just too intensive for someone to understand. This may be over their head. Maybe the course is too advanced for the specific trainees. Um, and this also can be due to newness of the or complexity of the nature of the subject matter itself. And we may be giving employees um, concepts or topics that we think that they're ready for, and they might not be. And that can be a really quick turnoff, and employees could end up failing that training. Um, the other piece that I think we sometimes forget and neglect to think about are time constraints. This is really important because as managers, we often are, um, you know, we're busy and we know that our, our learners are going to be very busy as well, but sometimes we forget exactly how busy they are because in life, you've got work going on, but once they leave work, they might have family, they might have friends, they might have things that they have to be working on outside of work as well. And so sometimes that can actually cause trainers or the trainees not to succeed because there are too many things that are happening. And without a great build in, um, in terms of a schedule, sometimes it's just not going to be successful. Another thing that I think is going to be is sort of tricky, to be honest with you, is lack of motivation. And I think that goes with the no management support as well. You know, a lot of times if we're not giving the learners this, this feeling or this push to want to get this training done um, and really give them, get them ramped up, we're going to find that sometimes they're just not going to be as invested in it. And it really what can help make that happen is management support. Having your manager being able to know what the training is about, know why we're doing the training, uh, and maybe even do some incentives that are in there, that may really help bring that um, you know, knowledge and, and excitement towards it um, that wouldn't be there otherwise. And I think that's one thing that we want to make sure we watch for. Um, the rest of them is things like technology downtime, we can't always control, but we have to consider, right? Sometimes we lose Wi-Fi if we're working on e-learning, um, and those things are important, as well as poor course design. Occasionally, we'll have learners jump into something that um, hasn't quite been vetted well, and then that's the case. Uh, we can actually be giving them a really negative experience and, and really turn them off because the course itself may not be in, um, you know, may, may not actually be suited for them at any, at any point. Um, and the last one, Dan, I'm not going to lie, kind of is the most common yet and my most favorite comment about it. It's uh, forgot about the course. And I hate to say it, but there's a million things that people are doing, so sometimes they do. Wow. Yeah, that's true. And I hear that most people, the only, the only type of management support that they get is an email reminder in 71% of the time that the only thing that prompts people to complete the training is they get an email saying, time to train, or did you finish your training? And while those are helpful, yeah, exactly. While those are helpful, sometimes they they get pushed to the bottom of the pile because time constraints and things like that that happen on a daily job, and so they really do just sometimes forget about it, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, when those things happen, it's important to recognize uh, when they're when those problems are coming down the pike. And so let's talk a bit about how to spot those problems before they really impact your training. Now, the surprising thing about poor completion rates is that they very often come as a surprise. The ongoing nature of training provides many con continuous opportunities to recognize these issues uh, in time to get the employee's training back on track. Now, one of the ways you can do this is to get periodic feedback during the course. 
If you want to know how employees are taking to the training, just ask them. Those of you that are familiar with the, uh, the Kirkpatrick scale, it's a four-level scale of, of measuring the, uh, the way of measuring the effectiveness of the training, the very first level is to ask the employees, ask the trainees how the training is going. Now, um, the best way to do these is you can do them from surveys or brief questionnaires. You can just have informal conversations uh, by the water cooler, or you can actually have short interviews with participants and get down to the root of how the training is going. And this really kind of helps you determine the quality of the instructor, the quality of the material, get, get a good idea of uh, at the very surface level of the training quality. If you want to get more serious, some people with large companies actually have focus group sessions with all the participants together at once to get an idea of the course before they invest too much time going through something that may be having a problem such as, uh, you know, th this is where you can get an early pulse on such things as equipment problems, maybe the people are having bandwidth resources or if they're having to work at home, they may not have the same type of computer hardware that is enabling them to, to do the e-learning, and you can solve those problems, nip that in the bud, and the way to do that is get feedback at the front. The other thing you can do is do assessments. Now, in a lot of Simply Learn courses, we have pre-assessment, particularly in the, uh, in the digital marketing sphere, and a, a pre-test for placement is one way that you can really help people complete their training, because they can uh, give them the opportunity to, for one thing, test out. Give them an option to test out of specific courses that they don't need so that they aren't bored and then they give up on the training and don't get some material that is really useful for them. At the same time, you want to make sure that you bring everybody up to speed because not everyone comes in to something with the same knowledge background, not like ITIL or any sort of computer software um, uh, uh, training. A lot of people may need to get up to square two where everybody else is. So with that pre-testing, you can kind of get some remedial training in there ahead of time that so everyone can, can start in the meat of it uh, at the beginning. Uh, I mean, start in the meat of it together. And this is really useful, particularly if you're doing anything like a live virtual class or particularly instructor-led classroom training that's uh, uh, on the, it takes a large investment and you want to make sure that you're maximizing uh, everyone's participation in their class so that everyone's up to speed uh, at, the, at the beginning. And the other way you can do that is through intermediate quizzes as they're taking the training. Give them a quiz and find out, you know, how are you doing? And um, what's interesting is that, uh, that pre-assessment pre does more than provide companies with an honest snapshot of their team's actual skills beforehand. Um, it actually provides a comparative tool to measure training results and then point out any needs for remedial refresher training. So about the quizzes, those are great because they can even improve learners' long-term recollection and retention of the material. The other thing you can do to help with the completion rates is to monitor the training as it's going on with dashboards. Now, the best training solutions include or integrate with the Learning Management System, or LMS. A good LMS includes dashboards that allow managers and trainees to see the assigned and completed training modules, measure their progress towards their goal, and to exchange feedback about the course as it's going on. The tools like the LMS dashboards and custom portals also enable managers to monitor who's advancing through the training and who's lagging behind. An LMS can show you like, when the learners have last logged on or when they've posted a contribution or maybe completed a quiz. It's nice because it lets managers report to executives on the effectiveness of the training even while it's underway. So you don't need to do a, a measurement right at the end. You can say, hey, if this is how it's going and it eliminates the unwelcome surprises and continuously motivates your learners, which is really important, is it addresses that motivation aspect that we just talked about, and it improves completion and certification rates by monitoring and motivation. So, so now, let's talk a bit about how to actually improve certification. This is where you should all be taking notes, because this is, uh, um, by the way, on uh, the taking note part, this recorded webinar will be shared with everyone who's attending, so we will also have the slide deck to review these details, and we have a nice white paper that we can send afterwards to just sum up all these great techniques. So Bob, let's 
dive in to how to improve these completion rates? Sure. First of all, when it comes to keeping it short, split it up, the key word is going to be chunking. You know, time constraints and limited attention span are both major barriers that can be overcome by delivering training using shorter lessons. So chunking is a popular learning strategy that improves, you know, comprehension and retention of long strings of information because it divides it up into smaller units or chunks and that's easier to process and commit to memory, which I think a lot of times we want to get a lot of information out and we forget that if we do it in smaller pieces, we'll actually end up giving people something they can really walk away with. Um, you know, the problem is that many employees kind of feel overwhelmed with how they will undergo training while carrying out their everyday job responsibilities, which we were talking about earlier is why people tend to fall short. A better approach to assign no more than two courses to a learner at one time. That was suggested by a corporate training expert, Robin McDermott, because as courses are completed, new courses can be added, tasking learners with doable assignments, and they're not overwhelmed with what they're working on. And that's really important. The other thing to consider is being able to split some stuff up. So if you have longer courses, split them into pieces, you know, like level one and then level two. Um, it's, it makes things a little bit easier for people to grasp, and creating shorter lectures, like two to seven minutes, is ideal. Um, and that's actually something we currently do in Simply Learn is we want to make it so that the learning that you're looking at is something that you can take in small bites because, you know, to be honest with you, Dan, I, most people are doing a million things at the same time. Um, and the hard part is how do you balance it all? So if you're working, let's say, 10 minutes on a course, you could probably get through two videos or a video and you can move on to something else. It's a gradual way to be able to bring that learning into your regular life because there's a million other things that you're doing. Yeah, that's certainly better than like trying to do one 10-hour course, which no one has really time to, to fit into their, uh, into their schedule, particularly if they're trying to do e-learning at home. That's a huge piece of it. It's the fact that people are doing e-learning at home. They're doing it on their commute. They're doing it really quick while they're making dinner or while the kids are brushing their teeth. Um, e-learning happens at so many different random places that being able to make them a bit shorter is to make it more realistic. Yeah, that's great. So another cool thing is that it gives them that, that short-term goal to help uh, because if you, if you complete something in the short term, then you think, oh, I've accomplished something versus this huge daunting chunk of learning that you have to do um, uh, right at the beginning. Well, and like you were saying, if you were to have, let's say, an entire you know, 10-hour course, um, I have a feeling that you would, or 10 one-hour courses, um, it, the, the difference between the two is how much you're really going to remember. Right? If you've got a shorter course, you feel like you've, as you said, accomplished a few things and gone somewhere. If it's a really long course with no breaks, people are going to forget where they started, where they ended, what they're working on, and then it sort of becomes you know, a fruitless amount of time spent. Yeah, it's also, when you break it up, I know that it also has the advantage of uh, that you can test people out of those chunks. So rather than saying starting people at a point in the course where they, they know too much and they're bored with it. You can test out of the first two introductory lessons or, the, or maybe even split it up among employees is to say, if, you, if you're doing digital marketing, for example, and you have someone that doesn't really need to know about SEO because that's done by the web department, they can skip out of that one or they can test out of it. And by having it in chunks, it makes it easier to make it more efficient for everyone. And plus, it gives you the opportunity to do quizzes um, and reward progress a lot more often. And then I think the final issue of that is that um, when you break things up in chunks, it's a lot easier on the bandwidth. So yeah. those people that are having uh, technology issues, um, if you have a small course, it's a lot easier to watch it on your phone or on your mobile device, um, and uh, and it it, uh, it doesn't get as clunky. And you don't have to start from the beginning again if it clunks well, out. Well, that's something that sometimes people forget too, because if you're downloading something before you jump on a train or or a bus, it's if it's a smaller piece, it's actually going to be much easier to download and much easier to to be able to work with. So, you 100% agree. Yeah. Cool. Well, what else? Well, you're talking about management support before and how important that is. Um, what, how can managers help improve this completion? So this is, I think, one of the key aspects of it. So if you want your employees to value this training, it's essential to create and foster a top-down learning culture where the management actually values the training. So priority tr prioritizing training is the single biggest way to improve completion rates for employees. That's what Eric Skilling says. He's a project manager at Vintage Path. And, and I think that's something to note is that when the employees feel that they're being supported by a manager who understands what they're going through, I think they actually feel like they're, it's more part of the team. 
And that's, I think, really important in terms of being able to get things accomplished, whether it's completion or just getting some understanding. The, under the organization should understand training goals as a whole. That means the management all the way down to the learners, because those need to com be com made, com excuse me, communicated to the employees. Um, these managerial actions help to ensure the training is valuable to the learner and is fully aligned with business goals. And the conversation expectation setting prepares the learners for actual training event. And that's where they feel like there is going to be a reason for the training. If you want great ROI on your training, you need to make sure that you are explaining why the training is important. And you need to make sure that everyone sees the value of why the company is putting money into training for its employees. That's a right. really yeah, you know, I know I know there are some cases where the training is actually compulsory. So where training is closely related to your job skills uh, and it's even required by like certification requirements we were talking before, there's no real problem with completion rates uh, when you make it a part of the job. Um, but uh, that's not something that every company can do. But one thing you can do, I know, is explain the importance of the training and do this before the training begins. Say this is how it's going to help you. This is why we need it, and uh, and also just tell them what they can expect to learn from the course and and how it's going to help them in their daily job performance too. Um, what's another thing managers can help do to uh, make it easy? You know, Dan, we talked about it a little bit earlier. It's that dedicating the training time. So I have actually seen clients do some really crazy and innovative things in the sense I've seen. Um, you know, lunch and learns where everyone gets to learn together at that exact same time, one day a week. I've seen people do where it's the no call hour where they don't get to, they don't get any emails, they don't get any calls for an hour um, once a week, and they dedicate their time for training. I've seen people do um, you know pizza lunches where everyone gets together and they do the training together. I, as long as the manager is building some time into the schedule, I think people are going to actually really value that training because they're going to see it's important enough to be able to take up some of their time during the day. That's really important. But I'm also going to tell you, Dan, if you do something like that, it's also important for people in the company to know. So you need to make sure that all supervisors are informed of that training, especially if there's going to be some time allotted for it. You want to make sure that everyone's on that same page um, so that doesn't make anything difficult for the learners that are in it. Right. Yeah, I know there are some times that uh, a lot of employees will want to sit down to, to do some training and then all of a sudden there's a, a there's a big fire drill and uh, uh, some project comes in that need, needs to get done and that training needs to be shown as it's a priority. And one thing you can do uh, is to establish a training manager and mentor. Not only does that kind of create an insulation between your employees and uh, any sort of executives that may want to uh, interrupt that training time, but also to oversee the training activities and uh, note the progress and the certification and they can report that to stakeholders. It's also cool to actually have the managers take the pre-assessment test or have the managers take some of the training so they you know, have some idea of what the experience is like from the learner's perspective. That will help understanding a lot. Plus, you know, it'll make, uh, uh, it, it'll build that respect of the trainees for the management as well, and uh, everyone benefits from that. You know what, Dan, is I, I had a client, a major marketing company actually in New York, that um, what the, the CMO actually went through the training and was able to speak to it. And, you know, occasionally you know, they'll throw it out, this is why it's important, everyone should do this, but they were actually speaking to the training that the learners were going through. And you could see when they were doing some roundtable discussion that when he was having a conversation, people kept, whoa, you, really, you did go through this, you know what we're going through, you took the test. Um, it was interesting to see people's reaction, and they were getting more invested because they felt like they were part of that core team that were doing that was doing the training. Right. Yeah, that's true. And uh, I think we'll talk about that later. Is that it, it builds that camaraderie with your other learners when you know this is an important progress, and it kind of makes it like an, the uh, it's a really bonding experience to kind of go through this initiation of learning because then uh, it's a. Uh, uh, it it kind of gives you the same sort of uh, uh, a feeling of belonging as belonging to like a little school you or yeah. belonging to a university and like you know go team it really adds I think I think uh, education and certification is are like a great part of employee team building and yeah. that's a, it's a much more important than just uh, massages or 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 uh, or golf golf lessons or outings at the uh, dodgeball game.
Well, and you know what? You sort of bring up, you bring up a really great point too, because um, it's really great for the managers to start to recognize the the learners for their training and their progress. And I think we, you know, often get wrapped up in all these projects and trying to get things done by deadlines. But sometimes we forget that our learners are there, and we need to acknowledge the work that they're doing. And that's really important. And so I think being able to give them that virtual pat on the back to say, "Hey, you did a great job. You've completed this lesson. You completed this course. Whatever that might look like," is important to do. And you know, in some respects, you can also even tie it to their individual goals or KPIs by being able to say, these are the things that we'd like to have accomplished in this given amount of time, whether it's the an annual review or anything like that. By being able to do those virtual pats on the back as you're going through the courses, it really does help come to a, a, a larger summation that when you're doing your um, annual review. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, a lot of companies are particularly companies that are focused on the services aspect that may not be piece work oriented uh, where sometimes there's it's it's helpful to have a quantifiable uh, KPI that uh, you can use to measure your job performance because a lot of it, particularly in, in, in marketing, is very subjective. And the nice thing about training is that if you go through it, then that's like something that everyone can look at and go, "Yes, I did that," and uh, that's uh, that makes me a much more valuable employee. And um, yeah, everybody benefits from that. So, um, what else can we do? There's um, we talked a little bit about testing out of it, and I think it relates to this uh, relevancy problem. If you want to make training easier to complete, make it relevant to every employee. Because the problem is that when you put training that's generic, it dilutes the relevance to the workplace, and it leaves them wondering, oh, well, how is this relating to me and my job? Because you can improve the completion rates by enforcing course relevance in uh, a number of ways. For example, uh, you can uh, choose or design the courses specifically for each team or employee. Um, like assignments, if you're doing, uh, Simple Learn does a lot of applied learning projects. And one of the things we do with that is that we have specific assignments, scenarios, or role playing work. Um, and that works best when it's specifically based on the job the individual performs. And you can even white label stuff so that you're use it, doing case studies that are related to your industry and even your own company. And that really helps demonstrate the relevancy of what you're doing. Uh, Pre-assessments also help demonstrate the uh, the knowledge gaps and remind people, oh, maybe I don't know it all. Maybe I, I am lacking some cybersecurity uh, education here. Um, I did not know about, uh, didn't know so much about uh, the Internet of Things and how that can affect my, my cybersecurity. And by letting people know how much they don't know with the pre-assessment test uh, or just with a little bit of training, then that makes them feel like it's relevant as well. Um, the other thing is that uh, uh, you can customize um, your courses, like we said, with the uh, with the decision-making exercises, like that applied learning, but even more so, you can you can actually schedule these e-learning courses to coincide with projects that employees are doing so that you can give the training right before they will actually use those new skills on the job. For example, if you're planning on integrating Salesforce into your, uh, into your months, you may not want to have, because there's a retention problem. If you, if you learn, if you go through a course, even if you get a certification, once you've learned it, you kind of forget a lot of stuff, if you, especially if you haven't put it right to work. So one of the best things you can do to make your training relevant is to time it as close to when you're going to need the skills as possible. Because if you have everyone go through Salesforce training and then you don't bring Salesforce on board for six or nine months, then by the time they get to it, um, Two things have happened. They've, most people have forgotten about it, and second of all, Salesforce has added some features that may not have been covered in the original course. I and mean, that's one of the nice, nice things about simpler courses that our course experts actually continually renew the courses and keep it fresh. So that's, uh, I think, that can help the relevancy a lot as well. Well, to piggyback off of that too, Dan, I think it's important because if the closer you do it to the training to actual. Um, projects and things that work, you're doing an application piece. And that's where you really can understand if they're if they're truly learning and applying it to work. And I think that's important. Yeah. So what about making the training social and team oriented? This is my uh, favorite. 
Yeah, how do you want this? Now you've got this great background because you've been not only doing uh, doing coursework at the university level, but as a as a principal and a, and a, uh, you were a, a math, you were a science teacher, weren't you? I was. I was a science teacher, and you know, while I try to keep student in, in attention, you know, between sixth and eighth grade. They're not always super in, in, intentive. So, you know, I occasionally would, you know, blow things up or jump on a table and light things on fire just so I could keep everyone invested in what I was doing. Science. <laughs> yeah, and it worked out great. It was, it was good for their attention span. So I think it was great, important. But I think one thing to note when you're ever you're doing any sort of training, social and team-oriented training is so helpful. Live student action always improves student engagement and course completion rates. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's the way to do it. Um, luckily, on-site instructor-led um, classroom training isn't the only way to take advantage of the, these interactiveness. So you can achieve this with online learning by creating virtual teams, which I've seen be very successful, or online learning communities, and by connecting the, some of these lessons via live video conferencing. So I know a lot of times we run into the idea of, well, if I can't do it live, is it going to be as engaging? Yeah, if you do set this up right where you have a, a virtual class um, or everyone is just doing e-learning, you can really still harness all of that energy and kind of bring people together at different points by setting up these virtual communities, allowing people to, you know, WebEx with each other and discuss it. Those are ways to bring people together, whether they're near or far. It makes it really helpful. Yeah. We have one question in here. Someone's actually asking, so is there anything to show, like, are there any statistics that can demonstrate that working in virtual teams is any more effective than working alone? I mean, has, have people looked at this? I would imagine they have. They have, actually. There was a study that was done in 2003. Uh, a gentleman named Chuck Easley, he was an assistant professor at Stanford University. He was able to find that students who worked in virtual teams were actually 16 times more likely to finish it. So that's a, an impressive number right there. Of the 23,577 students who worked individually, only 2% compl- uh, finished the course. Um, by contrast, of the 2,671 students in teams, 32 graduate, 32% graduated. So the same study showed that completion rates are even greater, 44% for teams that had a virtual mentor present. So okay. yes, having that team orientation really does. their stats that back it up. Yeah, and you mentioned that mentor thing too. We we kind of touched on that a bit. Having a mentor looking over it, even in a virtual way, uh, we're really asked to that help. It, and you know what also is sort of helpful, and I, and I hate to say this, and I, I did this a lot with my students, and I've also seen that as adults, myself as a learner, and myself as a teacher, that we find that there's a, a, this buddy system, right? So if I have a friend that is completing something in a course. I actually want to keep up with them. There's a little bit of this like peer pressure to continue to going, but it's also this loyalty because my friend's going to be talking about things that are happening in the course that they're going through. I want to actually be part of that conversation. So that's another great way when you're when you're building this social or team or environment, you can let them actually play off of each other a little bit. Yeah. And you get that, uh, we have that uh, phenomenon here called FOMO, which is a fear of missing out. And uh, I know that you can... Um, uh, uh, when, when people are motivated by seeing what other people are doing, if they're finishing projects or if they see like certificates or little awards that you can give away to motivate people, they see people uh, getting a little ribbon. I know this one place that uh, um, that I work, we actually all went through uh, first aid training and that became very exciting because we all got to get our little first aid cards and we got a little first aid patch that we would have. and. Uh, um, when people would see that, they go, oh, how'd you get that? Oh, I went through the first aid training. And uh, I'm sure that can uh, help a lot of other people too. Sure, it builds an excitement and enthusiasm for it. Yeah. Now, what else can managers do to kind of uh, uh, develop that, um, that team-oriented, kind of foster that team-oriented energy? Well, you did mention something when you were talking about the um, your patch and certification. Is if, if issuing even printed certificates, I've actually seen this done, and I think it is a really great way to sort of build that excitement is I've seen um, certificates by the company be made so that anytime people finished either work within the course or the course itself, they were given certificates to the learners and they would start putting them up in their cubes or their offices. And it's funny to watch how people see which which, uh, certificates are up and start working to get those certificates. I mean, it's a really amazing um, feeling to like have everyone want to be able to accomplish what other people are doing. That's important. In Simply Learn, we have certificates of completion, and I have seen, I've gone to companies where I've, you know, kind of walked around with the learners and got the chance to meet them, 
and I've seen Simply Learn certificates up, and I've actually heard people say to me, oh, I'm, I'm almost done, I'm going to get mine too. Without me even saying anything to it, they just see me look at the certificate, and someone else will comment on it. So that does actually work really well, and it's not an expensive thing to do. It's a very easy thing. Um, also, I find that just sending out some emails, some congratulatory emails, those go a long way. Um, one, it shows a little bit of value to the employee, but if you're sending an email out to the team and you're saying, hey, I really want to recognize these people for their, you know, making the most progress this week, you will notice the next week that all of a sudden you've got other people making more progress because they want to get in that piece. And it's, it's a little bit of like a celebrity sort of feeling, right, because I'm being recognized by other people. And you could also just individually create a celebrity by being able to say, this is the person that's working the hardest this week, or this is the person that I've seen the most success for so far in their completion. And that really helps build up people um, to want to do more because you're, you're not necessarily being negative to people that aren't doing it. You're really just highlighting those that are doing it. And it tends to build people's own um, interest and in, in, in value to want to continue with it. Yeah, I hear the term gamification thrown around in e-learning a lot. Is, is that what this has to do with? You know, it's a, it's a bit of that same idea, right? So if we're going to be doing things and kind of creating, a, make it a little bit competitive, giving badges, maybe even posting a leaderboard. Um, so we're doing leaderboards within Simply Learn, but I've also seen companies, you know, put leaderboards up on their own. Well, what's, um, a leader, what's a leaderboard? Oh, so a leaderboard would be, let's say you've got everyone taking a specific course in a group, and the leaderboard is those that are the furthest within the course, right? Or I've seen leaderboards, those that have the highest quiz or final test scores. So uh -huh. you're... You're sort of promoting those that are getting further, and it actually starts to push the other people to kind of keep moving. And, and it could even be um, course completion as well, how far someone gets within a course. Right. I think uh, another one, too, that helps is like giving people reminders, because I know that was one of the biggest issues that people have with not completing uh, training has been the fact that they simply forgot about it, but also give them realistic deadlines. Uh, employees are busy and they, they often get distracted and it makes it easy to forget and continue or finish your training courses that you've started. Uh, one of the things you can do is have an automated reminder uh, email campaign um, and that can have a, uh, have a great effect on the completion rates. Um, the, uh, um, because it just reminds people to sign in and, and, and get them started in the course again. Deadlines also help to motivate completion because you can offer employees a bonus for completing the training within a certain period of time. Um, now, when you establish deadlines, you just have to remember that you have to make it realistic. Um, a realistic target completion date is important because, uh, like in most cases, 30 days should be ample time to complete a course. But you know, there may be times when it takes makes sense to even shorten the schedule. Um, if the skills are going to be acquired sooner, the expected completion date should be synced with that timing requirement. And that comes up what we talked about before, where um, make your deadline and start the training actually closer to when they're going to need the skills. Um, also, I know it's helpful to have a learning management system or some other type of monitoring dashboard that makes it, uh, makes it easy to alert managers to um, the fact that someone's falling behind or not signing up to the learning, because then the manager can say, hey, uh, get with a program. And as the deadline approaches, you can just gently remind employees that haven't completed it uh, that the deadline's near. And if necessary, you can grant extensions um, with, uh, with proper reason. And uh, you can reflect those extensions uh, um, in the employee's training records. And uh, that kind of helps, helps as well. So, and now this is the big one. Let's talk about rewards, because that's the, that's the main thing that gets people doing anything, and that is uh, uh, giving them a reward or some type of incentive. Um, what are some things that you, you've heard about, Robert? So I think, you know, what's interesting is, is aside from doing things simple like creating certificates, which I think is a great way to do those, um, a lot of times recognition in general is just what's really helpful, right? So it could be done to being something as simple as giving a, you know, a quick, um, uh, like a gift card to something. It could be something where it's an email out. It could be an announcement at the team meeting. All of these different types of rewards are, are available. So if you're looking at you know what's on the screen right now, we've got incentives and disincentives, and it really depends on what you know matches best for your company, right? Um, and so I think you know you're looking at the tangible. You could do something that actually relates to job advancement. That's where I was talking about putting things into the KPIs or annual goals. Because um, that actually makes it very tangible for them to hang on to and work towards. Um, and like we said, there is a 
there could be a financial or a non-financial benefit. Um, and, and so I think there's a couple ways to look at that. I think another piece to look at is um, disincentives. And so you could actually get to the point where you say, hey, you know what, if you're not going to take this course seriously or take it, you're going to be responsible for paying for it. Um, and, and making them actually think about the fact that they're going to be paying the fee to it because, you know, occasionally we'll run into a situation where in B2B world, um, if you as a company are covering the, the cost for things, sometimes we don't take it as seriously as if we're actually p p putting the money out of our own pocket. Wow, that's great. Now, um, and it doesn't need to be expensive, does it? No, not at all. I, there's a million ways you could do things. You know, even if it's just a, a lunch for people, it could be something that simple. It could be again, a certificate or an email that doesn't cost anything at all. Um, there's a lot of ways to make sure that you're, you're really recognizing the people. And I think as you start to do it, you'll see what resonates most with people. Um, and, you know, people are going to react differently to different things, but keep it open to a lot of options for yourself. Great. Cool. So uh, let's move on here about now one thing that I, I kind of want to talk about disincentives here because um, uh, in cases where there's kind of a risk of something that's being used as the, the stick. You hear about the carrot and the stick. Um, and uh, you have to recognize that there are drawbacks to, to using more disincentives because mandating training, particularly if the skills learned are outside the scope of the employee's original job, then that can really kind of build some resentment. Um, now, if it's part of their job review, uh, I know experts kind of recommend that you should tell employees that will be looked upon favorably in their review rather than treating it as punishment if they don't. Because the trouble with penalties for less than stellar performance is that they, they often build resentment and result in people taking fewer risks and that stifles creativity. You don't want that in your business. So let's tell us a bit about uh, certification as an incentive. Um, how does that work? So I think, you know, I, there's a couple ways you could be really doing it, right? Because if you want to set up uh, external certification by a third-party industry-respected organization, it, it's a great motivator, motivator to complete the training because they're actually working towards that goal of completion. Um, it also provides numerous benefits to both the employee and the organization. So certification after training can, you know, motivate during learn, motivates during the learning by providing a quantifiable goal because they're working to get that actual certification from that third party. It also improves retention of the newly learned material because you know that you're going to need that to be able to take that third party exam. Um, it can also demonstrate to the learner that the course is relevant because we're not just saying, hey, let's take this course. We're saying, well, let's take this course. We need you to be certified in something. Um, it also is going to validate the employee's expertise to colleagues and, and customers. And that's a huge piece, right? Because if we want to make sure that, not that we want to uh, you know, be breakful all the time, but it's important to make sure that we can validate our expertise within our field, um, and it's going to improve the employee satisfaction, retention, and the employer rep reputation. And finally, it's going to provide employees with a valuable career advantage because they can use that when they move on to their next career, and that's a really important thing to, to think about because it's not just a once and done, it's a certification that they have. Yeah, those are great ideas. So, well, let's figure out a plan for success, like how can people, what are, here, here's a step-by-step -step, uh, list of things that you as a company can do to really help ensure the completion of your training. Uh, one of those is provide sufficient budget for development. Um, that's one of the hardest things for a lot of learning development people to come up with is, uh, is a, a a, a reason for the training. And one of the cool things about measuring this training is that you can develop an ROI and demonstrate the return on investment. Um, the other thing you can do is uh, dedicating ample time, like we talked about, for employee training. Make sure you use effective course design, keeping those short, engaging units, and also providing the training incentives that you just talked about. Um, also, uh, making sure that managers and supervisors support the learners and understand the learning process going on, and making it uh, making the training relevant through the customized content and even applied learning projects. Um, you can also provide employees with the optimum technology that they need, both in terms of the software and the hardware for the training, so that they are all on the same page when it comes to uh, doing this, not trying to fumble around on different phones, um, and give them the time and the equipment to do it, like on their desktop, even even ideally. And if they they have troubles with that, then uh, then help them out. And finally, establish a learning culture. 
So now, um, if there are any other questions that have come up, um, I, I just want to give this, while we're waiting for the questions to roll in, by the way, uh, everyone is going to receive a, uh, an email that has a recording of this webinar, so you can go through it again, as well as the white paper that accompanies it. Um, and uh, one of the things you need to know is that CEOs, uh, Paul Savardi, who's the, uh, who's the human resources coach at uh, entrepreneur.com, said that CEOs should think of employee development not as an expense, but as an investment. Because in today's economy, if your business isn't learning, then you're definitely going to be falling behind. And just a little bit of an overview. Tell us a little bit about, in a nutshell, about how Simply Learn can, can help that. Sure. Um, I think one thing that we always have to take a step back for, and this is coming with my, my teacher and principal hat on, is because pe different people learn best in different ways, it's helpful to use multiple delivery methods, including online learning videos, live online training, classroom learning, and even hands-on practice and role-playing methods. And that's a, the blended approach that Simply Learn actually is offering. And I think, uh, you know, you mentioned it earlier, Dan, that because it does all of those pieces, it's actually the reason why the completion rate is about 72% for our training services. And that's really important. Now, I'm going to say there is no single silver bullet when it comes to guaranteeing course completion. But, you know, applying many of these proven methods, I think, are going to be what helps make a training program better, more effective, more enjoyable for your employees and more applicable to their jobs. So keeping that in mind, you know, Simply Learn does offer a lot of these different medias to be able to use, and in the end, you want to think about what you're going to get um, out, of, out of it for your employee, for your company, and also for the long run. Great. Well, those are some great suggestions, and um, I, uh, I'm going to be happy with uh, sending, we have a white paper that details a lot of these uh, more specifically, and we'll be uh, sending a link to uh, all of uh, the attendees. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We have a few more minutes for questions. And you can also uh, ping us for an email uh, at uh, teamtraining at simplylearn.com, uh, particularly if you're interested in how we can develop a course for you. So um, with that, we'll just leave the questions open for a little bit longer. And um, yeah, and then uh, wrap it up in just a just a minute here. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to to throw into the hopper, Bob? I just reminded that if you're going to answer any ask any questions, it's going to be on your right hand side that you can go ahead and do that. Um, and just you know, one last piece to it is just think of the fact that if you are the manager that's setting up training, you're a little bit like a teacher trying to plan for a classroom, and so you want to make sure that you really do think about what your learners are going to be like. And as Dan mentioned earlier, make sure you're planning a budget for really solid training. You get what you put into it. So I think if I'm not mistaken, I, I read somewhere, and Dan, I apologize, I, I don't have the exact stat for this, um, but people spend, should be spending about, or an, an average, about $1,200 a year on their um, employees for training. And to be honest with you, I don't know that I see that as often. Yeah, what's interesting that I saw, um, the... Um, the budget for training has now uh, gone up to, uh, it, it used to be about uh, $943 per student, now it's, it's $1,200 per employee. And the, the rise of, uh, of money spent in employee training is actually double the uh, increased rate than the amount of money spent on technology. So people are getting the clue that training is important. And one of the cool things about that training is they're finding that in, in areas where you have a hard time getting employees to do those skills, and that's it's an expensive thing to hire people uh, to do something that you can just train existing employees to do. Because not only when you train an existing employee, that motivates them and that gives them an extra skill, and you don't have to bother with the recruiting cost and 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 you don't have to have that slow uptake where they get developed into the employee country, uh, culture, um, they just uh, automatically are uh, become much more efficient right away. So train your employees to do the jobs that you need to have done as your company progresses. And uh, you'll find that not only helps your company, but it helps uh, your employees as well. So with that, I think we're going to wrap that up. And uh, check your emails, everyone. In about a week or so, you're going to uh, get uh, a message that has a recording of this webinar and also the accompanying white paper, too. So uh, on behalf of myself and Simple Learn, I want to say thank you all for joining us today. And uh, Robert, thank you for joining us.
Absolutely. Thank you for everyone. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Good night and good day.